And aloha. Welcome to Talk Story, Maui's longest talk show, been 29 years plus. I'm Cindy Paulos, and we're going to have a fascinating talk um, with two wonderful ladies here, Sharon Lund, who has a brand new book. It looks brand new. Has it been out for a while? It's been out for a while, yes. Oh, <laughs> there is more, 18 near-death experiences, and Sharon's going to be talking next Tuesday um, at the Hospice Maui Meeting Room. Also with, with me today is Susan Ward who's with IANDS, standing for International Association for Near-Death Studies, IANS, um, that is going to be doing regular monthly talks um, on this subject. Um, The talk next Tuesday is going to be from 6 to 6.45, and uh, you can certainly let let your friends know about that. Is that the date, the right time, 6 to 6.45? What's the right time? No, 6 to 6.45 is going to be a meeting for people who have had near-death experiences. Oh, interesting. It's a peer support group, and anyone who's had that experience is invited. Uh-huh. And then from 7 o'clock on is going to be the general meeting where Sharon will speak. And every month we're going to have a different speaker. Great. And we're inviting anyone who who's had a near-death experience and wants to share it, to get in touch with us, and we'll definitely consider having them be a presenter at one of our meetings. Now, you've done this before in Santa Barbara, and you were part of the organization there, right? Right, And um, And Santa Barbara's a beautiful community, but boy, they've been going through some difficult times in this last year. Yes, uh, <laughs> definitely. Really, really challenging times. I mean, our thoughts to them, my gosh, what they've had to go through. Um, but are you living on Maui now? Have you moved here? I have, and I loved the IANS group in Santa Barbara and mm-hmm. really missed it. Mm-hmm. And it was tremendous support for me. I lost my daughter four years ago, mm-hmm. and just having the reassurance that she's fine mm-hmm. and having people who have had near-death experience um, come back and share it was very reassuring. So I I would encourage anyone who's g- grieving mm-hmm. still, um, or all of us have, have, loved, have loved ones who have gone to the other side. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's very reassuring to know that they're in, in a really good place. I've, I've been, uh, I probably did about four or five interviews with Anita Morajani, who, yes. of course, Wayne Dyer kind of discovered her. Right, and helped her to get a book out. Um, and, and she had some interesting experiences, and I've done many interviews on the subject, but I do find it interesting that um, you will find similarities and also differences. <laughs> you're, you're nodding your head, Sharon. I think you've understood this because you had 18 interviews you did um, where you've seen that, that, that it's so fascinating how people have individual experiences, but it makes so much sense. Because just like anything that happens in life, anyone can experience anything. And you'll have, if you had 18 people experience a similar situation, um, you'll have so many people describe how, what it did to them and what they went through in different ways, right? Cindy, that's so true. In the, in the book, There's More 18 Near-Death Experience, we had one gentleman that was Native American. So when he had his near-death experience, he went to a blue crystal cave, Mm. and he saw his mom there. Mm -hmm. We had another woman that had a near-death experience, and she believed in angels, and she saw angels. Mm -hmm. Uh, We had somebody else that, you know, their closest thing to them was their their pet. And when they had their near-death experience, they saw their pet. Mm -hmm. Uh, For myself, I saw spirit guides. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what vibration are you on, or what do you believe in, or what would bring you comfort? Whatever you are associated with, I believe that's what you're going to see when you have your near-death experience, or when you die. I absolutely agree. And I have to say, I haven't had your typical near-death experience. I had it through meditation and an enlightenment experience, and I went through that stage as I was going out of my body and into the light, and I went through different stages. So I didn't experience it in death, but I had many experiences where I was supposed to die and I didn't die, right. partly because I was in a different state when the occurrences happened, and I could actually manipulate and direct the situations Correct. a little differently from that place, you know, kind of maybe out of body, um, yeah. which is a much better way to direct experiences <laughs> like that than in the body because I wouldn't have wanted to go through what... 
I went through in the body too many times. What were your experiences? What happened to you with your near-death experiences? Well, I've had two near-death experiences. The most profound one was the later one, but the, I started out um, in 1984 after being in a very abusive relationship and also being anorexic that I attempted suicide. And I sent my daughter here to Maui to live. And after attempting one time, I went, finally the second time, I went and, and leaned myself over against the, the bathtub and put a razor to my wrist. And I said, dear God, if, I'm, if there's anything I need to know before I kill myself, let me know. And instantly, the entire bathroom room filled up with this gorgeous, beautiful white light. And I immediately felt calm, and I felt at peace, and I felt this intense love. And I heard my child, it's not your time to die. And that Get was your, your child that had died? No, me. Oh, your, your child. No, me, me being the yeah, child. Yeah, okay. The child, okay. <laughs> your ch- my child, it's not your time to die. Get yourself in the hospital, and when you get out, you will become a healer, teach around the world, and write books. And none of that made sense to me because I was a secretary before that. Really? Yeah, but I did go in the hospital, and when I got out, I became a healer, and then I traveled the world teaching, and now I've got three books out, working on my fourth book. And and congratulations on that, having five books out. I know it's a lot more work than anyone, you know, saying you're going to write a book is one thing, doing it, (laughs) and then getting it out and publicizing it is another whole project. And not only did you do that, you've had... uh, Great success. You got to appear on Oprah Winfrey's show, 48 Hours, Eye on America, CNN, and you were featured in the uh, O Oprah magazine issue on November 7th. How did you, did your secretary work, or were you think that you just opened doors from your experience as your soul was opening doors for you? How did you get to the stage? Because it's not an easy stage no. to get to where you can get to that recognition and talk to people about this. Well, what happened, I was living in Los Angeles at the time, and this was in the mid-80s, and I became the very first woman to go public that I was infected with AIDS. I saw my ex-husband on a Dan Rather special saying he was dying, and so I got tested, and sure enough, it came back positive. And then right before you he died. You found out by seeing him on a TV show? I did. He didn't Christmas tell you. Christmas time with my family. And he visiting. never told you that? He never told me. And you yeah. were divorced at that point? I was divorced a year and a half. And he never told you? He so never you told get me. tested, and you had AIDS? I came back positive, I, and then he called me um, right before he died, which is about nine months later, and admitted that he was infected when when he was married to me, but he didn't know how to tell me. Wow. But, you know, it's I could understand it at that time yeah. because it was a gay man's disease. Yeah. And when I became infected, I didn't know of another woman that was infected. Mm-hmm. So I went to a holistic doctor, and she encouraged me to go public. And that's how I got all the media, and that's how I got traveling around the world because I was Not so— Not because of the near death, but because no. of the AIDS. Well, about isn't the that, AIDS, isn't, all about the AIDS. That does say something, doesn't it? It's, it's kind of interesting. It is. And I feel like every challenge was a blessing. Yeah. You know, it was a gift and an opening and made me whole and complete and really brought me my, la- my life purpose to live it with passion. How did you encounter the second near-death experience? The second near-death was in March on March 17th, 1997, and I had been sick with AIDS complication, uh, PCP, pneumocystis carnini, pneumonia, and uh, MAI or MAC, which is a, a, a macrobacteria, and it causes diarrhea and it causes... Um, vomiting a lot Mm. and I went from a normal weight down to 81 pounds oh my gosh and my parents and my daughter and my sister were called in and said I wouldn't make it through the weekend and my daughter um, I made a point that I didn't want my family around me at that time I wanted to go through the process myself and the process of dying the process of trying to heal and not die (laughs) okay okay and I, I knew that if they saw me the way in my condition that they would see death and that's not what I wanted them to see. Mm-hmm. But I look like death. Mm-hmm. Um, At 80 pounds, yeah. Right. I right. mean, for, you can't see your folks, but you're about 5'7". Yes, I am. Yeah. I mean, right. 80 pounds is hard to right. even. Um, and I've seen people that, but they've been sick with cancer. I'm very, very close to Absolutely. death at that point. Yeah. Yeah. So my daughter was looking in the uh, the hospital door room, and first glance, she didn't even recognize me, and then she came running towards me, and she said she wanted to sleep with me that night. So she crawled in Aww. bed with me and Aww. put her arms around me, and I couldn't really talk, but her warm body just wow. really warmed my spirit, and telepathically we talked a lot. And the next morning, she says, Mom, I'm going to go to your house and take a shower, and I'll be right back. Is there anything you want? Mm-hmm. And somehow I got the energy to say yes, you to come back to me. 
And the moment she walked out of the hospital bedroom or the hospital uh, room, immediately my spirit was lifted out of my body. And I looked down at my body and I knew that this was it. And all of a sudden, I felt healed and I felt a real sense of peace. And two spirit beings came towards me and I could see them, yet I could see through them. And I sensed them to be male and female. Mm -hmm. And they said that they wanted to show me a review of my life. So I saw a bird's eye view. I was looking down in Russia where I was teaching before and Japan where I had taught and Mm -hmm. helping the gay men make their transition Mm -hmm. in different scenes. And they kept saying, look at the difference you've made in these people's lives. Mm And then all of a sudden, I felt myself going through the tunnel of light, and there were gray beans on the outside of the tunnel, and it felt like they wanted to grab a hold of me and go through the tunnel with me. Mm -hmm. And as I'm going through it, I'm thinking, where are my two brothers that have died? Where are all my friends uh, that died from AIDS complications? Mm -hmm. Where is everyone? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, once again, that glorious, beautiful, bright light, which I call infinite spirit or God or Buddha, whatever you believe in, came before me and I became one with that light and it was the most wonderful healing feeling love that I've ever experienced in my life and I heard my child this time you have a choice the other time I didn't Mm -hmm. this time you have a choice you can remain with me or you can return but before you make your decision I want to show you one more thing and instantly I was reliving. Now, just, did you know who that voice was saying, my child? I call, you can... I call it God or infinite spirit mm-hmm. is what I call it, correct? Was it a, Not, not God sitting that, in a chair. It, did it have a voice similar to, could you tell by the voice? Was it a voice of spirit? Did a voice have a male or female? I would say male. Mm-hmm. Okay. But very low. But it was more vibration, too, yeah. though. It was a, a pulsating vi- vibration talking. Mm-hmm. And... Um, so I made the, I said that uh, he, I heard I had a choice, but I had to see one more thing. Mm-hmm. So I relived, just like where the three of us are sitting here, I actually relived being pregnant with my daughter, mm. feeling the first kick with my daughter, giving birth with my daughter, and doing things with the 18 years of my daughter. And then a spark of light hit me, and I was back in the tunnel of light. And telepathically, the light of God said, what is your decision? I said, I need to return to my daughter. And instantly I was back in the hospital bed, still looked like a corpse, but for the next hour to hour and a half, every single cell in my body was vibrating with light, and it was bouncing up and down, and I could see the vibration of light. And when Janine, my daughter, came back, I had energy, I could talk, and that day I got up and started walking. And I hadn't been out of bed for almost a year and a half. That's amazing. I had a similar experience with light. In fact, my business is called Bright Light Productions. For that reason. Great, love it. <laughs> and um, I was 15, and I left my body, and I went into that light. But I went through various stages before I got to that light. I went through a, actually leaving the planet and looking down on the planet. Uh-huh. And I could see the planet actually covered in dark clouds and, and see it. And then I, I went to um, kind of the mental plane where I saw all the questions and answers and questions, any questions being asked, answered. It was wow. geometrics. And then I went beyond that to kind of the solar god level, and I had that white light, which is, again, when we say white light, folks, it's not like a white light when you look at a lamp, no, okay? No. This is a light that is so bright, it's like a million suns. It's a light that we can't really put into words how exactly. bright that light is. Exactly. And that light completely uh, went into my heart with this love that completely just, com- there was no love and hasn't ever been any love like that since. That love completely opened my heart up and mm-hmm. completely made me feel um, the experience of union with God, and, and I felt, and again, I'm using the word God, but the experience is all light and energy. Exactly. And, and that love, that amazing love. And I just wanted to stay there in that place. And then I had the same question. Now, you can stay here or you can see, you know, your life and go back. And I went, well, people really should know about oh, great. that there is this light, you know, that there is this love, that, right. you, that people can experience it, that there is more, you know, and, and that, 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 you know, it's like, I'd like to stay here, but <laughs> I think it's important people and that I have more to do in my life to, to share this. In, and that was at the age of 15. Wow. So, and at that time I was extremely shy. And obviously now I've done, I don't know, I've probably done 30,000 
interviews since then. Mm -hmm. But, you know, on the radio, talking in many different subjects. And I don't talk about this often. I had a similar experience to you one time in a dream. I was in a waiting room, and I was told in this packed waiting room, what are you doing? And they all said, we're waiting to die. And I said, well, that's strange. What do I do? And they said, well, there's this podium there. And walk over and look in. And when I looked in the dream in the podium, um, there were places and that I could have been living in, in life, or maybe I did in other lives. One was Scotland. One was India. Um, different places. And then I wow. saw the place where I was living at that time, the Russian River. And I said, oh, that's it. I want to go back to the Russian River. And I literally became one with the energy of that field of energy, uh -huh. came back and knew I'd chosen to live, not die, uh -huh. woke up, and like a week later, um, I was going out to go horseback riding, and my horse threw me. There were other experiences that were kind of interesting, but I knew I wasn't going to die. My horse threw me. I had broken ribs. I didn't know it at the time. I went to the hospital. They couldn't stop my lungs filling up with liquid. Um, after a week, they went in my lungs and found that exactly where my horse threw me, my ribs had been broken, and... That there was a tumor there that oh, I knew nothing man. about, and they so that was a gift for sure. Literally, my horse saved my life by wow. throwing me, and then they found out through the ribs and everything, and that there was a tumor that had to be taken out, wow. and and so that was another experience. But I've had others also that mm -hmm. were just really impossible to describe, but too much beyond coincidence for me to ever question. You know? Right, understand. Um, and and once you open that door to possibilities, I found also that people are always holding on to right where they are more than they ever realize. And um, we are sometimes holding on so tightly we don't realize that we're holding on to the exact space that we choose to be in any particular moment. Mm -hmm. We don't know we are, right. you know, but we are. We're creating this experience right now, right, exactly. without us even knowing why or how. Exactly. You know, and, and if people do want to experience life after death, they can do it in meditation. They can do it in many ways. They can do it by reading your book or just listening to you talk. Um, but the main thing is I think people not be afraid of death because that fear is not, a, a, first of all, it's not wanted by the energy that, that is, mm -hmm. and it makes the passing difficult, more difficult, right? I agree. And I, and I, agree. I hate to say this because I know every religion plays a role, but when people hear in religion that there's all these stories about this hell and damn fire mm -hmm. and you're going to burn up, and uh, it creates such fear in people about death that, yes. that causes, I think, a terrible um, mindset that makes it very hard for people and makes them afraid to die sometimes. I think that's the, the key thing right there is the belief that there's a hell. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so scary. So I want to thank you for coming back and for educating people. I know that a lot of people that didn't choose to come back, that were forced to come back, they're very angry that they're back, and they don't want to be here at all. I I often just, I mean, that's why I meditate every day. I meditate every day and write, but that's my time to kind of go back. But it's not near, if you, it's not near the light. You can't experience the light that you experience. No, you can't. You know, you can experience degrees of it. But if you're supposed to be here, you're supposed to be here, and you're not going to be in that place. But it is difficult. You you miss it, don't you? Miss that that light that, that you experience and that I love? I do, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But I'm I'm very happy I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> very happy to be doing what I'm doing now. And, and in these books, when you were doing the 18 near death experiences, what was and you were they different? You said there were different experiences. Well, there were different experiences, but there was like a commonality. Um, almost everybody, when they came back, their vision was stronger. Things mm. were in 3D. The colors, the colors were really are brighter, bright. So Absolutely. much brighter. Like, almost like... Iridescent, uh, yeah, almost. Yeah, glowing uh, yeah. with a brighter light. Seeing the energy of the light. Yeah. And almost I've seen auras ever since I had that experience. Do you see auras? No, I don't. I don't. I've seen auras around people. Oh, Not color yeah. auras, but auras, energy right. auras. And everyone has different energy auras. Correct. But that happened after that, that I started uh -huh. seeing auras more. And I see more auras sometimes in some places more than others at airports. I oh, see, that's an interesting place I to sit and watch auras. <laughs> I see, and I don't, tr sitting and watching, it just happens where all of a sudden I can see auras around people more. Wow. Um, and I don't know why airports, but I think something about being up in the air and coming down or what some of the, maybe there's souls watching out for them more when they're traveling. That's why I did a book about flying and traveling. Interesting. But, but so in these experiences that people had, they saw things differently, but did they all feel 
that they were no longer afraid of death when they had these experiences? Every single one of them, even the one, well, we have a couple people in this story that had distressful NDEs, which was hellish-like, and they they told us about their stories. Did, but what were they, they people with the deep relief in religion? Or their actions and behaviors that they were, that they had committed. Yeah, their <laughs> karma. Know, kind their of, karma, yeah. right. Yeah. It was mm-hmm. more that than the religion. And what happened was that they went through that, but then all of a sudden they saw a spark of light. And when they saw the spark of light, that's what drew them out of it. And every person that I know, that I personally know or I've heard of that has has had a distressful NDE, it's changed their life forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have gotten out of the violent way that they lived or the religion way that they lived and gone to spirituality. So it's been a transformation for them, even though they had to go through the hellish experience. Uh, you know, it, it, it's also interesting because it occurred to me, and I haven't done these interviews. I'd find it very interesting. But, you know, just like you said, you had a life review of sorts. Correct. I think that that's kind of a karma. If you've had, I think that people who've committed, that you experience any pain you've caused other people. And that is what people think is hell, mm-hmm. is that you're in the life review experiencing what you did to other people. If you hurt them, you see that experience. Exactly. And that is what people think is hell. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, forgiveness and going through that process, that's why I did the book Angel Blessings, going through a forgiveness process and a healing process if you know you're in hospice or you know you're close to dying is such a valuable thing because you really literally can pave the way for a clear transition, I think, if you... Do your life review before you die. I definitely agree with you. 100%. You know, and, and you go through that if yes. you, and see what what did I do in this life? You know, right. what could could have been done? Can you forgive other people? Yeah. Can you you know send them energy if they're dead? Can you express that forgiveness? But but yeah, I mean, did in these ones that people went through kind of these difficult experiences? Did they say they had a kind of a solution, or did they have any fear left about going back and going through death again? Or? They have no fear at death at all, mm-hmm. none at all. It's completely vanished. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, and did all of them have that experience of rising above their body and what I call the astral plane into their astral body and looking down? All of them did have uh, out of like considered like an out, out of body, body experience. Right. Some yeah. of them went further than others. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. And in that place, it's interesting. I've found similar stories when I've read that, that the difference in time, Anita Morajani, who, who's written some beautiful books on the subject, saw that she actually said she actually saw her brother flying in, trying to make it in time to be there for her death, Aww. and that she tried to communicate. She wasn't able to communicate with him, but she realized that he was trying to fly in to be with her right, right. At, at the deathbed. And um, yeah. so, but did you see other people and were you able to tune into other people that you knew by the thoughts? No, uh, personally, myself, I did not. In my uh, near death experience in the hospital, I didn't see anybody that I knew in the tunnel. And I, the people that I knew is when I had the bird's eye view, when I was helping gay men make their transition and being at their bedside, I knew them, mm-hmm. you know, in places that I was teaching, I knew those people. But as far as uh, family members, you know, I really thought I would have saw my brother and uh, both my brothers and things but um, after I died the next day my brother did come to be in spirit and actually stood before me in spirit and said you don't have to die I'm always with you wow so, yeah <laughs> now that was the first time this was the second second time, time. yeah and he said I'm always with you right. but he was already passed he passed uh yeah he passed when he was 23 years old yeah, so, so that was an accident? He was on a motorcycle accident, and a dr- driver killed him. So that yeah. you'd already had something there, and that was before you had your attempt of suicide, Yeah, right? actually, uh, Tommy came to me for about 18 years after he died. And wow. He, then after fin- you'd had that near death? No, before. before. Oh, before, before. I was did. 21 when he died. And, and he, he still was 20 came to And he spirit. came to me. Yeah, we were extremely close. Uh-huh. And he came to me on a regular basis. And then after 18 years, he says, I can't come to you anymore because Time you're holding for- me back and I'm holding you back. Well, that that opens the question that I think is so important. And, and it, once you experience some of these things you're talking about, you realize that people who have left their body still are certainly can be aware of of their loved ones yes you found that to be true from what absolutely you, and and people don't realize that their loved ones um want them to know that it's not that they're okay right that right. they're not 
the, and many times, like you with your brother, they're there, right? Exactly. And and they're available. It is interesting, and I have found this after a time. It is holding back the person mm-hmm. from moving on to another level. If you are, and when you're at that other level, like you said, with that light and, and that love, there's uh-huh. so much more that you want to do. But if you're stuck, kind of feeling concerned about someone like you, like your brother was. Right. You would be holding him back. Exactly. And it's great that you were able to understand that. But at that point, did you experience the loss of the loved one at that point, knowing that he, he had to move on? I did feel emptiness for sure. Yeah. But, you know, Cindy, the veil between life and death is so thin. And when I work with people that are preparing for their death or their transition, I always try and, and help them in a way that they can leave a sign for their loved one. Let's make a sign agreement. Mm-hmm. Like when my mom died, you know, you know, turn on the light at Christmas time, you know, and make them blink a couple times, <laughs> you know. So just make a sign so that person, so the family or loved ones know that they are okay. Because a lot of people live in the fear that they're not not okay or you know are they okay you know so just make you know an agreement yes I'll give you a sign that I'm Mm -hmm. okay that I have heard people do and I've heard that it happens in interesting ways my uh my sister um had talked about death my older sister had talked about death with her husband and they hadn't come to quite an agreement but they knew they both liked birds and he passed away of a he had a uh He'd fallen and had a, a blood clot, and and he died. And she was planning. He was he'd gotten um, three Grammys for his music, and he was a composer. And the, she was trying to plan a whole big service and memorial. And it was kind of a whole Hollywood thing, and she didn't think she was up to it. And there were times she just thought it was too much, and she should forget the whole thing. And the <laughs> red cardinal to me, cardinals are messenger birds. Mm-hmm. I've always found that. But this bird would come and just tap on the window. More than once, this happened to her like four times, wow. where the bird would come and not just tap once or twice, but tap on the right. window. Get, my, get your <laughs> get, attention. I'm yeah, talking to you. I, I'm here for you. And and she did get it, finally. Good. And it was also a strange experience my mother had, because I started in metaphysics and meditating, because my father died the day after Christmas. And um, my mother was wondering what was going on, kind of. And I don't think they'd... He was very, very mathematical and didn't necessarily believe in life after death. And she hadn't thought about it. Mm-hmm. Three days after he died, she came to her, he came to her in spirit, kissed her on the forehead and said, there is a forever in Aww. his voice. So she started looking into what's life after death. Right. And she, that's when I started going with her to these... Um, at that time, parapsychology classes mm-hmm. and metaphysical classes mm-hmm. and meditating. And that was her opening to understanding right. that there was um, life after death, you know. And she got it in a beautiful way. And then I was able to follow. And when she passed on, um, I got all these words for my first CD. And I called it There Is a Forever because that's what... So I did a song, There Is a Forever and Other Music. But it was Beautiful. coming to me through her, and I knew right. it. Right. And, you know, I knew she's kind of moved on. It was so beautiful. When you have that spirit coming to you, when you have a loved one coming to Correct. you, uh-huh. th- I don't know how we could describe this to people except there's a grace. There's this energy that is just so Pure loving, and, loving. And, 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 and wonderful that happens that you are feeling protected because you feel their energy around mm-hmm. you did, did you find that with your brother i did absolutely did you write down did he bring you messages of sorts he, or he brought me messages but i never wrote them down mm-hmm. you know at that time i was too young <laughs> yeah yeah but i didn't write them down i just remember how uplifted i always felt every time he left and he says i'll, I'll come back again you know i'll be back soon did you have to be quiet or did you have to be in a place no open to i could it be happen anywhere i could be anywhere yeah. but i i felt a real connection with him when i was out in nature yes you know more yeah, than yeah. anywhere else so when i was out in nature alone or amongst the trees and yeah. the green grass or the ocean you know it seemed like that was easier for him and i to communicate or come together it seemed well like. nature is in a, bed a, Nature is yeah. a very, very healing, healing. place. And right. it's, for me, it's like going to church when I get mm-hmm. out from nature. That is my church. <laughs> yeah, me too. You know, yeah. And here we have so many beautiful yeah. churches, although some of them have been closed uh, because of storms and things. Um, but, but this whole experience, I mean, you look back at your life, you know, you have gone through a complete life change, and you've seen this in 
all of the people you inter- did you interview more and just pick 18 or was it 18 that you had total no actually i did a documentary called dying to live near death experiences and in 2010 it won the second place in the honolulu international film festival oh really and so from that then i interviewed other people and created the book because that's what i was divinely guided to so do so this book to came it. from it came from the, the documentary, documentary and we added in and expanded the whole interview of the people instead of just clips of the people well, now that's very, very interesting. So you were able to do that, and I didn't do it, Cindy. Well, that's true. When I was told, yeah. when, when I heard in meditation that I was going to be a, doing a documentary, I said, no, I don't know anything about documentaries. Wow. I don't know how to do it. And what I heard is, you're not going to do it. We'll be doing it through you. And yeah. everything just flowed and came with grace and ease, and it was powerful. It was the most profound experience to just release, surrender, and allow spirit to move through me and work through me. So where are you in your life experience with all this now? You're obviously talking. This book came out in what year? There is more. 18 near-death experiences. What year did that come out? This came out in 2010. Wow. Okay. Right after the film. Okay. So, yeah. so since then, have you been guided maybe to do another book? I'm in the process right now of doing my fourth book. But more importantly... I heard last year, or actually it's been, no, I've been here three years now, so I I guess it's four years ago, I heard that I would be helping to set up a green burial site, and I had no idea where it would be. (laughs) Oh, yeah, Bodhi. And somebody guided me to Bodhi, and I'm working with Bodhi B. here on Maui to uh, find the funding for the green burial site. And I just, I'm just open to wherever I'm supposed to be. And right now, my focus or my, my goal is to, Focus, Sharon. Focus, focus. We need this green burial going. So that's what I'm doing, and also my well, well, book. Well, let's explain to people who don't know what we're talking about, what a green burial site is. A green burial site or a conservation cemetery is uh, everything is biodegradable, earth-friendly. There's no embalming. There's no um, headstones. It's plants or trees instead. Um, it's bringing back nature and people going back into nature and, and in the – green burial site or conservation uh, cemetery that we'll have we'll plant trees in different rows and different kind of trees and then whatever fruit is grown then we'll sell that to to the community and stuff so but it's going to be more than it's not going to be like a regular cemetery there's going to be palm uh, ponds and there's going to be walking trails and picnic areas and it's going to be a for the living and the dead Mm -hmm. it'll be a very beautiful healing environment for all i think that's lovely i was telling um, susan and you about um hospice is is getting um, a beautiful lovely um, garden for meditation that they're going to be doing which i just think is fantastic yes um that they're going to be able to have um, a garden for meditation and i know that the people there um are going they're very excited about it you know and and i see your vision i hope some of your seeds of your vision could be happening um because it would be lovely to have some of your vision in that garden as far as um, the setup because I think you've got a clear vision of what a beautiful garden would be. Yes, absolutely. Um, for, for, that would uh, facilitate that. Because there isn't obviously a church at hospice, uh, you know, and so their outdoor area could be their church mm-hmm. of sorts, right? Now, Susan, uh, we haven't, I know, we haven't talked to you a bunch, but, I mean, you've obviously been involved in this and you're going to be talking about this. You lost um, four years ago. You lost I your, lost my daughter. Your daughter. And, and that was also an accident? No, she had breast cancer. Oh, yeah. And it was quite a journey for all of us. Yeah, because that's a... And she's... But, you know, you talk about paranormal experiences and contact with our loved ones on the other side. I could write a book about the ones I've had ever since I was a little girl. Really? So there's never been any doubt in my mind that there is no death. Mm -hmm. It's just, I've always said it's like switching the channel on the TV set. Mm -hmm. Just because you're watching Channel 2 doesn't mean Channel 4 doesn't exist. Very good description. And so I think, you know, as I said, hospice, uh, excuse me, well, hospice was amazing. I don't know if I could have made it through losing Mm -hmm. my daughter without them. But um, Ian's was such an inspiration to me. You found that through hospice? or No, you no. how did you find IANS? I've and again, if you're just tuning in, IANS is International Association for Near-Death Studies. Um, and, and it's a, a good organization that is now, through Susan's help, going to be having once a month meetings here. The first one being next Tuesday, starting at 6, 
at the hospice uh, meeting room there. I, I don't know if everyone knows where hospice is. Most people do here, but it's just above uh, the emergency room on the opposite side of the street just before um, overlooking the Maui Lani Golf Course there. Yeah, and you know what IANS focuses on is research. They do, they publish papers, people who have been doing research on near-death and out-of-body experiences and paranormal experiences can submit papers. They have a newsletter. They have a conference every year. The upcoming one is going to be August 30th to September 2nd in Bellevue, Washington. I've been to two of their conferences, and they're absolutely wonderful mm. workshops and presenters and They've had Anita Marjani and Evan Alexander and some of the leaders in getting the word out that really there is no death. And there's some beautiful movies uh, um, out on the subject now as well, which I have to say, um, did you see that one, that beautiful one with Robin Williams and um, Simon's film, um, What Dreams May Come? Yes, yes. I mean, I saw that one. Oh, you haven't seen that, I Sharon? I have not. Oh, you have to rent that one. What Dreams May Come for me was uh, an amazing experience, and it did, it kind of was interesting because Robin Williams plays the guy that loses his wife, and um, and then he thinks that she kind of had gone through a very dark period, which was equal to hell, and she goes, he goes to try to bring her back from that state, you know. Um, and But it, it describes interesting levels very, in a beautiful way, mm-hmm. I felt, you know. Yeah, um, and I think, you know, I think the IONS meetings are really a wonderful place for people to explore what what happened. Sometimes people have had near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences, and they don't really understand what happened mm-hmm. or what to do with it, and their energy has shifted, and they find themselves not in the same emotional body that they were in before. Mm-hmm. And it can be very, very difficult for people to figure out what happened to them. So to share that with other people and to hear speakers who can give them a a perspective on it is really supportive. And that's what I found when my daughter passed away was even though I'd had a lot of paranormal experiences, I was interested in what Sharon said because when my father died, I was 23 and he came and visited me the night that he'd passed away and he was with me for about 18 years and then and I just got chills and then in a deep meditation he came to visit me and said the same thing you he said you can handle your life now and there are things I need to do so I'm not going to be as close as I was Mm -hmm. and I felt him move away Mm -hmm. but before that he had been with me in so many different ways and the lights would flash in our house and got so common that we'd just say oh there's dad and (laughs) the phone would ring one time Mm -hmm. and oh there's dad (laughs) so you know things like that are so reassuring I I always have seen it a very interesting pattern also with some of the people who achieve the greatest success in life um have had loved ones that have passed away at a young age. Their parents have pa- passed away or someone very, very close to them. And I've always felt that the ones who've had a very close parent or a relative or a loved one pass away, that those people are acting as guardian angels for their life and will many times bring them so many blessings. And I'd like to try to convey that to people who have lost loved ones that that the person is there in spirit and really watching out and helping them and, you know, looking out for them as what we call guardian angels. Yes, and if you're, if you're open to it and willing to really be aware, there are signs everywhere yes. all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And some of them not so subtle, mm-hmm. like you were talking about the red bird the, yeah. <laughs> that was pecking on the window. And, for example, when my mother passed away, it was January in Santa Fe. And about three days before she died, two white doves landed on the railing of the balcony. And my sister and I looked at each other and said, where 
are white doves coming from wow. in January. Mm-hmm. It was cold and snowy, and there they were sitting there cooing. Mm. And just signs like that. I had two white Magical. doves come. Actually, one white dove first, and then the second one came, and I had them um, for quite a long time. Um, and they actually had a baby, which I call BB, Big Beak, Big Beak Bird. Um, but but no, the same thing. And before my mother passed away, a pigeon came and just stayed there at the mm-hmm. house. And um, I, you know, I've learned from me. I think you know here in Hawaii, we believe in almacuas. I've I've learned to watch my almacuas are birds, but I've learned to watch um, for almacuas signs because. You know, maybe it wouldn't be a bird for someone else. It could be, uh, you know, a dog, a cat, a shark. Right. A, it could be anything that they are, their spirits are connected coming to. back. Yeah, and connected to dolphins, you know. Um, and, and and it could be many different ones. And, and, of course, Native Americans have a similar feeling about their spirit guides as well mm-hmm. coming back to them. Um, and they have a lovely way of, of actually doing spirit quests and vision quests to to be in touch with that. I I don't think we have that same path, although uh, there's a wonderful group, and you might have heard from them, because I believe they're based in um, Santa Fe, New Mexico, or close to that. There's a Zen group with a wonderful Zen teacher, um, and the Roshi there has uh, created a whole way um, of doing transitions and death experience, and has a hospice-like, but it's a Zen-like hospice-like. It's not following regular hospice rules Mm -hmm. for people who are passing. And Joan Halifax is her name. And oh, she does sure. talks everywhere sure. um, yeah. on this, you know, and she's yeah. created a beautiful thing. And I'm going, well, there is lots of ways. I mean, I love I love what hospice does, but it wouldn't it be nice also if there actually was a spiritual uh, group that allows you to go to them and experience this in meditation, in talks, in groups that, you know, support you. And I think IONS is um, probably one of um, a few I know we talked about on Near Death um, conference that happens too um, that Terry Daniels does but there's more and more for good reason there's a need for this yes. and enough people have now experienced it but I, I'd like to ask both of you because I don't talk about it a lot because a lot of people think you're too woo woo <laughs> or crazy if you talk about this and a lot of people have had these experiences and haven't talked to other people because they think people will think they're crazy if they talk about it which is why I ans. It's the perfect place to be. It's such a great place to be because people wouldn't be there if they thought you were crazy or if people had an experience and thought they were crazy. Mm -hmm. It's a very reassuring place to be where they can find out that this is not abnormal. Mm -hmm. Um, Terry Daniels' um, conference is called the Afterlife Conference, Mm -hmm. and it's incredible. It's not woo-woo at all. It's mm-hmm. very down-to-earth. A lot of hard research has been done, and it's they talk about quantum physics and the energy fields that are measurable. Oh, really? And I hadn't known that. Auras that are measurable, mm-hmm. that um, the presenters are excellent. And the same thing with the IONS conference. So there's a lot going on that would not be considered woo-woo. And I think we're getting to a place where spiritual philosophies and science are coming together. And that's to me, is really incredible that now we can see that all these things that have just been dismissed by the scientific community as being woo-woo are being proven to not be woo-woo they're being proven to actually be measurable. Mm-hmm. Um, I would agree with you 100%, but there's still a long way that has to be bridged between certain religions because as more and more of this happens, um, it's interesting how people's lives are changed spiritually, um, but a lot of the people don't necessarily turn back to religion, I found. What did you find? Did you find, Sharon, that people were looking back for religious support, or were they just going to that spirit inside? No, it, it seems like almost everybody that I interviewed, they left their religion that they were connected to, be it you know, baptism or Catholic or Buddhism was kind of still yeah. still up there. I mean, they were still connected to that. And I love, was, I'm a Buddhist as well, but okay. I, I've always had this issue having experienced union with God, and then, then a lot of the Buddhists say there is no God, and I'm going, but, you know, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is a God because I've experienced right, God, you know. Right. 
So it, it's interesting. I think um, I'm a yoga teacher, mm-hmm. and I had an interesting experience where I was living in a very small town in Colorado, and I was invited to teach at the senior center. And at that time in this town, a lot of people were very fundamentalist Christian. Mm -hmm. So, and I had not had a good reception. I opened a yoga studio there, and I didn't realize that the Baptist church across the street, that was not okay with them. Really? Right. They For yoga, were, even? They Well, coming from wow. Santa Barbara, what did I know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? They were picketing the yoga studio, no. and they said we were doing devil dancing. Oh. Wow. So I was a little nervous about the idea of going and teaching at this senior center. I didn't know what the people's philosophy was. I didn't know what kind of reception I was going to get. I felt like I was walking, like Daniel walking into mm-hmm. the lion's den. But my guidance kept saying, just go, just go. So I did. And what I realized was a lot of it was in the terminology. Mm-hmm. If you talk about the Holy Spirit, yes, but change it to the life force energy within you, or you're talking about um, pranayama, yogic breath, and you're talking about inhaling Spirit, yeah. in Italian, the word for inhale is in spiritu, then you're bridging that mm, gap between mm-hmm. religion and the spiritual. And it's a matter of labels. I totally agree. And I do find that to be true as well. And if you can um, get into that communication of the energy without getting hung up on the words, but able to bring them into that energy you're, you're sharing with them. Um, huge, huge differences can be made in communication. Absolutely. Um, be, just because the people feel the love, you know. I think a lot of people are, are originally attracted to Christianity because of, they like the love energy, you know. And sometimes Buddhists are more attracted because they like the mental, you know, awareness of watching their thoughts, mindfulness. You don't hear a lot of talk about mindfulness in Christianity, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, well, there's, but, <laughs> there's mindfulness in Christianity can be translated as prayer. Uh, yeah, maybe, you know, that's prayer, because I'm, I'm writing a book on pra- prayers, affirmations, and meditation, and prayer has a huge, in different people's minds, different connotations of what prayer is, too. And there are different types of prayer. There's many different types of prayer. So, you know, I, absolutely. I, so I, that's where it's kind of like when you go to the other side, mm-hmm. and my thought is, although I haven't been there personally, but hearing a lot of people talk about it, you're welcomed to the other side at the level of your understanding. I would agree 100%. And so your definition of prayer, your definition of spirit, your definition of life force, your definition Mm -hmm. of God, it's all subject to the same the same thing it's all very subjective and if you're sitting in you know pran if you're sitting at the end um savasana at the end of yoga or if you're sitting in a church in silence what's the difference anyway if you're in silence you're going to be in in a space exactly that is the same space it's just that you don't have the words attached to it you know you haven't labeled it you haven't labeled it and and at that point you're all good you know (laughs) and I think we do get hung up on labels and if we can drop them Mm -hmm. and just be able to allow the experience Mm -hmm. allow what what is and that's just being and that's being human you know and we're expanding <laughs> we're we expanding, expanding in the process of we doing are that. i mean human is spirit in form you man you is spirit and man um but and and woman a little similar but a little different too but it is that we all are experiencing the spirit and form you know and and we just again put the labels on it but so you're experiencing spirit and form but when you die you just are spirit Without this particular, you drop the form, drop the form. and mm-hmm. and but there's other energy fields, absolutely, and energy thought forms and other ways of of communicating. It's just not with the physical body at that time, and it's so beautiful to think that all of these experiences that you've documented and you've heard about, 
in that spirit, able to communicate with form still when necessary, you know, Mm -hmm. um, for the time needed with that grace of covering. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, And it's so beautiful. People can get past there. And there's certainly an understanding of, of the suffering and compassion for that. But if you can get past the suffering and, com- and, and, and understand that spirit will come to you and help you get past that. If you can even leave a little bit of room open mm-hmm. in your mind, in your heart for that to come in, uh, mm-hmm. amazing things can happen. And one thing I want to say about the IANS um, organization is that they don't promote any particular philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's not a religion. Mm -hmm. It's not promoting any particular paradigm. It's just a place for exchange of ideas and understanding and support and communication. And that's what's so beautiful about it. It's really very open forum. Well, can people go to the uh, website for IANS and, and find out more? I guess it's I-A-N-D-S dot org. Is that the general overall? That's the umbrella organization. Mm-hmm. And then we've just set up a web page. Mm-hmm. It's just in its infancy, but it's there. It's called um, IANSMaui dot com. Is there a slash or is it just no, IANS just Maui? Okay. I-A-N-D-S and Maui dot com. And if people want to contact you about talking or coming, obviously um, they can go there. Is there other places to reach you if they're curious about uh, maybe speaking sometime or finding out more about the meetings? Yes, they can email me, email me at susan at yogaheart, all one word, dot com. Susan at yogaheart dot com. And Sharon, how can they find all your books and information about what you've been up to? They can go to my website, which is www.sacredlife.com, and they can email me at Sharon at sacredlife.com. It's so beautiful to see you, too, and it's so nice that you, again, through what you're doing here, Susan, with IANS, be able to, to bring Sharon in and let people hear and know about her. Are you living on Maui now? Yes, I live in Kihei. Oh, isn't that Maui wonderful? Oh, that's great. That's, so it's a good... Returned a, home. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful way to uh, bring this together. And this will be the very first meeting coming up next Tuesday, right? Right. And 6 to 6.45 is for people who have had near-death experiences. It's, it's a support group uh, of sorts. It's whatever comes out of the group. It's for, for people who understand each other because they've been there. Mm-hmm. And then the general meeting is from 7 to about 8.30, depending on how many questions and answers we and have. And you'll be talking at that time, Yes, Sharon? I'll be the guest speaker. That's Sharon. Mm-hmm. And I just have to say this. The fact that Sharon and I are sitting here together yeah. is really synchronistic because I was being s- supported by the woman who started the IONS group in Santa Barbara, and she's been doing it for about eight years and she said, if you want to start a group in Maui, um, I'll help you. I'll do everything I can to help you. And apparently she put the word out in California. And someone that she knew was involved with My the IONS group, group, group that I was involved with. <laughs> in San Diego. And said, oh, well, we have an IONS person <laughs> in Maui. You need to get in touch with her. Well, I'm so glad it's happening, and I applaud that uh, the energy and the work and the love you're putting into this. I think it's wonderful, and it's great um, that you both could make the time to come today. I know you've got a meeting at hospice in Thank a few you. moments. Say hi to Greg down there for me. Uh, Greg Lavoy has been doing work there for so many years and has created such a lovely center. So uh, kudos to the wonderful hospice people and all the volunteers that make that place so, so very special as well. And um, we're just about out of time, but I just want to say a big, uh, big blessings and mahalo to both of you for sharing your story so lovely here. And thank it's you been for having us thank here and so for doing much. the work that you're doing. Thank Many blessings you. to you. Thank Aloha. you for having Aloha. us. Aloha. <laughs>